Good evening and welcome to tonight's University Days 2022 virtual lecture with Professor N. Bruce Dutu. I am Carol Almond morton Executive Director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. It is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are the indigenous peoples of this land here at Berkshire Community College. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. We are committed to act in partnership and with the support of indigenous peoples of the Northeast as we continue to learn about their history, celebrate their culture, and engage with their artists, writers, musicians, naturalists, and scholars. I would like to name my gratitude to the volunteers who have made this program and all the programs for We Are Still Here possible. Thank you for your time, your passion, and your willingness to share your experience and gifts with the community. And thank you to PCTV for recording and distributing this lecture. You can see the full schedule of events for We Are Still Here, Indigenous Peoples of the Northeast, and our upcoming fall semester of courses at the following website that I'm going to pop in the chat, berkshireolly.org. And now I'm going to turn things over to Catherine Kidd, our OLLI University Days Committee Chair. Oh, Catherine, you need to unmute, sorry. <laughs> Oh, oh okay. maybe I'm, unmuted. There we go. Okay. Beautiful. Uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, Bruce Dutu is the professor of, uh, is the Samson Occam Professor of Native American Studies at Dartmouth. Um, and as some of you may know, Dartmouth was originally founded as a school to educate Native Americans and has uh, reestablished that um, mission in recent years and has a, one of a leading program in Native American studies of which um, Professor Dutu uh, has been chair. He's a leading scholar in Native American law and policy and has published widely in this area. He published Shadow Nations, Tribal Sovereignty and the Limits of Legal Pluralism and Native, um, and of Legal Pluralism, I'm sorry. And that was published by Oxford University Press in 2023. He's also published American Indians and the Law which is for more general audiences like ourselves. He's also a contributing author to the Handbook of Federal Indian Law, which is used to teach in law schools where they have programs regarding Indian law. He has taught also at uh, the University of Vermont Law School and he has lectured on indigenous rights around the world, including in Russia, China, Bolivia, Italy, France, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Professor Dutu is an enrolled member of the United Homa Nation of Louisiana, and his wife, uh, Hilde, is a Jibwa, and they have three children and three grandchildren. I'm going to turn this over uh, to Professor Dutu at this time, but I will remind you that we are in webinar format. And if you have questions or comments for Professor Dutu, please put those in the chat and we will open time up for questions and answers at the end of our evening. Take it away. Thank you very much, Kate, and thank you, Carol. Uh, and a special thank you to all of you joining us um, this evening. Um, I'm joining you tonight from Vermont, so I am uh, broad beaming in from the ancestral homelands of the Abenaki people. And uh, we're very fortunate to have a number of uh, local Abenaki neighbors and friends who are colleagues of mine at Dartmouth College. And uh, it's a privilege to be engaged actively in um, 
participating and telling their stories and sharing their stories with our students and community uh, members. The topic for tonight, as you know, is Dawnland Sovereigns, New England Tribal Nations in the Era of Self-Determination. And I wanted to start this evening with a question for you. And the question is, does history empower or imperil us? Does history empower or imperil us? And perhaps uh, it goes without saying that that depends on whose history or which history we're talking about. Or another way to say it is, well, what stories uh, do we tell ourselves? And when we come to stories about national origins, uh, we know that we are at a moment in, in our national history where those discussions are fraught, very contentious, very divisive. And, um, but we have encountered these moments before and found our way through. Um, tonight, I wanted to start by relating that in the context of a piece of literature that I use in a course that I teach at Dartmouth. One of the courses I teach is called Native American Law and Liter Literature. And in that course, students are reading legal opinions in parallel with or in conversation with works of literature by Native writers. And one of the texts that what I've been using for the last few years is by Tommy Orange. Some of you may know this book, There, There. Uh, Tommy Orange as a Cheyenne writer um, from Oakland, uh, ancestral roots in um, Oklahoma. And this book was a, a, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2019. But in connection with my opening question about uh, does history empower or imperil, um, here, I wanted to read a, a brief passage for you as a kind of an introduction to our discussion for tonight. Um, this is a chapter that focuses on one of the main uh, characters in the novel, a woman named uh, Opal Bearshield, um, who has a few nephews that she cares for in this story. Opal was on her route yesterday when her adopted grandson, Orville, left her a message telling her he had pulled three spider legs out of a bump on his leg. He'd scratched it open and out came those spider legs like splinters. Opal covered her mouth as she listened to the message, but she wasn't surprised, not as much as she would have been had this not happened to her when she was around the same age Orville is now. Opal and Jackie's mom never let them kill a spider if they, if they found one in the house or anywhere for that matter. Her mom said spiders carry miles of web in their bodies, miles of story, miles of potential home and trap. And she said, that's what we are, home and trap. I wanted to suggest that partly the opening question is informed by this notion that history uh, can, can be both a home and a trap in terms of how we see ourselves, how we tell our own origin stories, and how we make sense of our world as it evolves and looking ahead towards the future. Who's included in our stories, for example? Along with our own stories, uh, who else's stories are being told? Uh, and also whose stories are being uh, silenced or erased? And so, uh, there are miles of stories that we need to tell to, uh, to truly understand the nature of um, the situation of tribal nations in the US and New England uh, in particular. We, we know, many of you will know, that there are um, contestations over land, uh, political power, economic development. We'll talk about these issues tonight. And even notions, the very notion of sovereignty, you know, political authority uh, within certain spaces. Who has the power uh, to uh, control uh, or to essentially govern in particular areas? Where does that power come from? How is it limited? Do we have an understanding of how to share power? At a certain level, we do when it comes to the federal government and uh, states under this notion of federalism, adjusting and accommodating each other in terms of their respective spheres 
of power. So we have some basic um, shared history of sovereignty that is can be uh, divided between two um, spheres of power. But when we add the first sovereigns, tribes, that's, that's when we start really getting a lot of questions and a lot of um, uh, concerns about um, well, who's included in that? What's the nature and scope of power? And um, so to frame, I wanted to use that to frame and open this discussion about um, when we think about the sovereign nations residing in their ancestral homelands here in New England, Maine, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Connecticut. Um, we know you've read the papers, you've lived, many of you have lived uh, in areas where this is often front page news, uh, in issues involving tribal nations, uh, the focal point could be uh, the return of lands, it could be debates over jurisdictional, can the tribe uh, do X, Y, or Z. Um, sometimes the battles are over forms of economic development like uh, casinos, uh, offshore uh, wind projects, the, the, there's a host of issues that give rise to what are at the heart battles over power. Who wields it, who gets to use it, who limits it, and why? So I want to uh, start with, you know, why are these issues so contentious? Um, uh, they have been historically, they remain contentious in the modern era. Why, why is that? So I'm gonna offer a couple of thoughts about that, broadly speaking, um, and then turn the discussion uh, in a more focused way to the tribes, the tribal nations um, here in, in New England. One of the first questions or one of the first issues that we have to contend with is, is uh, how we think about tribes uh, as collective entities within the United States. It's very easy and often uh, common for uh, folks in the US to think of tribes as simply another distinct racial or ethnic minority in the US. And uh, doing so ignores uh, what is, at least from a legal perspective, uh, the, what we regard as the cardinal principle of federal law dealing with tribal nations. And that's the principle that tribes exist in the US as distinct political bodies. They are governments with rights of self-determination. These governments predated the formation of the United States. They were here when colonial powers were first uh, on these uh, uh, shores, uh, claiming lands, negotiating with tribes, warring with tribes, uh, in, in essence, engaging in different ways for uh, ascendancy. Uh, in what is now the United States. How do we know, where is this uh, status memorialized? Um, where would we look uh, for evidence about this uh, recognition of tribes as government bodies? Well, we, the starting point would be the US, one starting point would be the US Constitution. As many of you know, uh, in the US Constitution, Article One, with, which prescribes uh, the powers of the legislative body, the Congress, um, Article One lays out that Congress has among its enumerated powers, the power to regulate commerce with the foreign nations, the several states and with the Indian tribes. So it's right there in Article One where tribes are uh, explicitly mentioned by the framers as um, in, the, in, the, in the context of other political entities with, with which the federal government is charged with the responsibility of engaging in a formal political relations. So again, the Congress is in charge of managing relations with foreign nations, the several states, and with the Indian tribes. We also have a legacy of treaty making, another diplomatic practice enshrined in the Constitution. Um, and was applied, the practice of treaty making uh, was applied not just to uh, foreign powers uh, like the European nations still um, uh, exercising authority within certain parts of what is now the United States, but it was also applied to tribes. George Washington, uh, for example, uh, uh, began the practice of 
of uh, continuing treaty making with the tribal nations as formal practices of diplom diplomacy between the US uh, and tribes. That is one story that we have uh, and can uh, and do tell ourselves. Uh, but parallel to that story, the formative story that says tribes uh, predated the formation of the US, they exist and are recognized explicitly as uh, political bodies, governments with powers of self-determination. All of that uh, sounds uh, quite uh, strong and um, clear evidence that there is a place for the tribal nations within um, the fabric of our constitutional democracy. But parallel to that story um, has been a longstanding story, a different story, that it's more in the, not so much in the political legal realm as much as in the sociocultural realm. And here I'm talking about uh, attitudes of, um, uh, or viewpoints that, that, this, that make distinctions between um, this, the value accorded to certain societies and practices. And here I'm talking about um, uh, Euro-American views uh, that see, that have long seen native peoples as uh, less than, less valuable uh, than uh, Euro-American society. And this has been manifested uh, in so many different forms, including within the law. Um, so for example, we see very early evidence that the US, despite what I just said about, you know, Congress empowered to regulate commerce with the tribes, the use of that word with, I keep emphasizing the term with, I'm a lawyer and we do pay close attention to language and um, uh, the word with connotes a sense of bilateralism, right? In, in terms of two entities in relative equipoise engaged in uh, relationships of coexistence on shared territories. That's sort of a, um, a, a best case scenario of how to envision what the framers may have uh, had in mind when they wrote this language in uh, Article One of the Constitution. But, but there was also this other viewpoint that uh, was well entrenched uh, long before the US was even formed. We inherited uh, this notion of seeing tribes in, 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 in ways that were not um, positive, savage, uh, uh, savages, um, heathens, uh, uncivilized, uh, et cetera, the, the names can go on. And these attributes, this kind of uh, uh, d d differential is uh, manifested early on in federal Indian law. And in one of the very first cases to come before the US Supreme Court, uh, which is very germane to some of the things we'll talk about in the context of the modern era, <clears throat> reflect uh, this viewpoint. So in 1823, sounds like a long time ago, but uh, it was actually rather late in the, in the history of our nation to contend with a, a core issue. And the core issue was when it comes to um, uh, the property, the legal uh, rights that people have in buying and purchasing lands, um, uh, where does the legitimacy of those transactions um, uh, uh, stem from. In other words, uh, if the Europeans were the later arrivals on these shores, um, the, they, many of them saw the tribes as the first owners of their lands. They were governments, they were the ones controlling territory, the ones to be negotiated with for uh, permission to, to share these lands, etc. And yet, by 1823, when the Supreme Court had to resolve a, a, a case involving two non-native parties fighting over lands in what is now the state of Indiana and a portion of Illinois, um, they decided that uh, you know, the, the warring parties were each tracing, they were telling different stories about uh, who had the superior title. One party said, well, our ancestors in title derived their title from the native peoples. You know, if you go back in time, the, the original signers of these deeds bought uh, this land from the original owners, the Illinois, the Piankishaw tribes who were resident there. The other party argued that they had superior title because they bought their title from the U.S. government, which exercised this uh, ultimate authority over all of these lands. 
the US Supreme Court ultimately ruled that the, the latter party, the ones claiming title from the US government had the superior title. And they ruled uh, in part because they said that the native uh, tribes lacked the capacity to, um, to own the land. They could not be seen, in other words, in law as fully um, immersed in uh, 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 vested as rights bearing societies. And why is that? Well, because they were not civilized, they were not Christianized. And this is in the Supreme Court's decision. The case is called Johnson against McIntosh from 1823. And so here you have an opinion that's rooted not in law and policy, but really in social and cultural attitudes and perspectives that uh, attach uh, uh, weight and value to these differentials, these perceived differences uh, in culture and assign them uh, weight uh, in the legal calculus to say, because of these attributes, because of your savagery, because of your lack of civilization, because of your lack of having Christian origins uh, and, and structures, uh, you, are, you are not possessed of the full rights that um, Westerners are. But they weren't deprived of all rights, the court said. The, the, they retain some rights and they retain what the court called the right of occupancy, the right to live on their lands, but the ultimate title, the, the, um, the owner was the US government holding it in trust uh, for, these, for these natives uh, who were on the path toward civilization through uh, Christianization and mission, missionary activities, but were not quite there. That decision, by the way, 1823, is still the law of the land. And there's another uh, set of cases that came just a few years after the Johnson case. Uh, all of these were written, by the way, by uh, Chief Justice John Marshall. So they're known as the Marshall Trilogy. In 1831 and 1832, John Marshall wrote what are known together as the Cherokee cases, where the Cherokee Nation uh, was trying to um, fight off the efforts of the state of Georgia to subject them to state law or to uh, simply have them removed from the state of Georgia um, for, for power. They wanted the ultimate authority within those lands. They wanted control of the rich resources that were located on these lands, including gold that had been recently discovered there in the 1820s. And in the opinion in which the Supreme Court ultimately sided with the Cherokee Nation, and said, we made treaties with you. We promised that these lands would be yours forever. Um, so uh, powerful uh, confirmation of the respect accorded to treaty making in the early period of the US. But in the course of, of its opinion, the court said, but the US uh, is entrusted with a certain obligation towards the tribes because it stands in relation to the tribes very much in the, in the position of a guardian over its ward. And they characterize tribes as de domestic dependent nations. And this, this is, you can draw a line to that phrasing to the language used in Johnson against McIntosh that uh, again, has more of a sociocultural uh, uh, perspective and sees tribes as less than. And then uh, in, in the Cherokee cases, we see a kind of, instead of a, of a horizontal kind of relationship, uh, more of a verticalized, the US up here and tribes down here, the kind of a parent-child uh, relationship. Along with that view, there was also in this era and well into the 20th century, a, a long-standing view that natives were simply not long for the world. In other words, there was this preoccupation among um, uh, during the late colonial early American period where what is now known as the dying Indian thesis that tribes were, were soon to, to, to be wiped off the face of the earth. Um, and, and so why obsess over particular the particularities of legal arrangements if these people are simply not long for the world? Uh, and this view persisted over the generations and reached a kind of either apex or nadir, depending on, on one's viewpoint. In 1913, so into the 20th century, in 1913, Congress actually set aside land 
at the tip of Staten Island, where they were uh, there to, to, to build what was going to become a monument to the departed race. President uh, Taft showed up with uh, an entourage from Washington, DC. A number of uh, older native chiefs were there and there were architectural drawings, uh, renderings of what this statue was going to look like. And it was in the shape of a, of a, of a, of a male figure dressed in traditional native uh, garb um, and uh, standing, had this, had this monument been built this, the figure would have stood about 15 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty. It was never built, the funds were never were, were not uh, raised uh, and, and the project um, died, uh, but the, uh, it, it's, it's to illustrate the persistence of this viewpoint that, that tribes were uh, simply not gonna be around for, for very long. I say all that by way of, of comparing these two stories, that stories have the capacity to uh, be a home. In, our, in other words, uh, we can all trace a sense of belonging in this place, but it can also be a trap in the sense of it's a story that leads to marginalization, to dispossession, um, and, and so forth. And so for tribes, both historically and in the modern era, it makes a huge difference in terms of which of these narratives does one latch on to in terms of understanding modern day contestations over power, over land, over cultural practices, um, et cetera. It also leads to discussions about which uh, tribes have, uh, have the latitude or the right to engage in, in these practices. If tribes are in fact uh, having the status of governments to uh, what, what are the requisites uh, to become uh, recognized as tribes uh, enjoying these powers? And that's an entire other um, uh, lecture uh, that I would I would have to give. But it's uh, it's it's uh, relevant to put this out here early to say that um, for many tribes, um, the uh, sort of the operating system, if you will, for engaging the tribal powers of self-governance, um, uh, for better or for worse, uh, rely on and depend upon this recognition by the federal government of their sovereign or governmental status. And that's usually been achieved through the history of treaty making with certain tribes, or they were the subject of congressional laws, or executive orders or judicial opinions, any, any of those formal legal acts would stand as testimonials to the federal government acknowledging the uh, formal existence of the tribe as a government. Now, not all tribes engaged in treaty making, uh, like my tribe, uh, the United Home Nation is not a federally recognized tribe. I grew up in a, in a tribal community uh, I went to an all Indian elementary school when I was growing up in Louisiana, uh, and yet my tribe never had a, a history of treaties with the federal government, uh, were never acknowledged in an act of Congress, et cetera. And so like many tribes in New England, uh, like the Abenaki here in Vermont, we persist as a distinct cultural group, but lack uh, that critical indicia of federal recognition that allows us to engage in acts of uh, and practices of self-governance. Now, let me turn to the tribes in New England in particular um, to uh, kind of bring us uh, um, into the modern era, but we're, we can't leave the history behind. Uh, and so in the course of this um, part of the talk, we'll be having to make reference to some of the things that I've talked about, about before. A couple of things to point out. Obviously, from the point of history, the native peoples of the Eastern seaboard from New England all the way down to the Carolinas and Georgia and Florida had obviously the earliest and most sustained contact with Europeans long before tribes in the, in the Great Lakes area or in the far west uh, encountered uh, Europeans uh, and later Americans. And so the process of dealing with other societies uh, bent on establishing a, a definite foothold in these areas, which is why uh, we call this practice settler colonialism, which is uh, simply the practice of establishing uh, a homeland in, 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 in occupied um, uh, areas. Um, 
the tribes, uh, the tribal nations of the eastern seaboard had um, sometimes hundreds of years uh, more experience than tribes further to the west, and which, which means that there's a longer period of time to deal with the, the many issues that arose, battles over land, battles over power, and even battles over identity. At what point does one retain the claim of being a native person? What if there's been a history, for example, of intermarriage? Um, does that sort of dilute uh, the, the, the bona fide claim to an indigenous or native identity. These are some of the battles that we see today, but they were being fought uh, in the earliest periods of our country. Um, the, the, the tri I wanna take you to the 1970s um, because that's a, that's a radical move from what I've just been talking about because I wanna lay out a few things about uh, more contemporary experiences of tribes in New England. I think it's fair to say that um, the legacy, the impact of the dying Indian thesis had uh, terrible consequences for the tribes, particularly in New England. Um, for example, uh, how many times have some of you um, or heard about the, the Pequot Wars of the 17th century extinguishing all the Pequots or the last of the Mohicans? Um, there, there, there are this constant references to uh, the ultimate demise or extinguishment of a certain group or groups of, of indigenous peoples uh, in these lands. And, and, and that carried well into the 20th century um, uh, and, and, and was reflected in the law in the sense that where there are no federally recognized tribes in New England because they're all gone. Um, at least that was a sort of a, a, a common, commonly held view uh, in many parts of the country and within the government as well. Uh, in fact, there was a, a 19th century uh, decision from the Rhode Island Supreme Court dealing with the Narragansetts that, that held that the Narragansetts uh, had been uh, utterly extinguished. They had ceased to exist. Uh, I think they call them a remnant uh, uh, of, of, uh, the, of another group. Um, and, and, and so we get these kind of pronouncements in various ways, either formally in law or uh, through uh, public uh, views and opinions of, you know, that there are no, there are no longer uh, any natives or native tribes uh, in New England. Uh, of course, that, the, the truth is that there were still very extant legal uh, or, or uh, native communities throughout New England, um, throughout this period. And... Uh, following on the heels of the American Indian Movement in the 1960s, civil rights movement as well, uh, there was a considerable energy uh, to seek um, recognition of these longstanding but um, uh, inchoate rights of self-determination. So tribes began to press, uh, particularly tribes in New England, began to press um, for their claims. And they found that uh, uh, um, uh, in, in old laws like the 1790, uh, a law passed when George Washington was still president of the United States, um, the 1790 uh, Trade and Intercourse Act, uh, one of the first laws passed by the U.S. Congress pursuant to its powers under the U.S. Constitution, it did something quite dramatic. Uh, it, it monopolized within the federal government, the authority to uh, um, uh, uh, approve um, uh, tra land transactions dealing with native lands. So in other words, if someone sought to purchase lands from, from, a, from a tribal nation, um, it required the imprimatur, the approval of a federal agent, someone with the authority to bind the US government. And this was a carryover practice from the, the uh, British crown where King George, George III had, had uh, enacted uh, the proclamation of 1763 that, it, that had done essentially the same thing, monopolized within the crown the authority to legitimate transactions with lands. The, 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 alt the alternative was everyone, it was a free-for-all. People would go out and were doing this, were buying and selling native lands and uh, expecting the, the crown to defend those claims. And here the, the, the same claims were brought for the U.S. And sort of forestall that, uh, those claims, the U.S. Congress um, uh, declared that unless a transaction was was um, validated by a U.S. agent. It was null and void. 
Well, guess what? In the 1970s, the tribes in Maine, the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, um, and Maliseets, um, were able to use, their lawyers were able to use the 1790 Trade and Intercourse Act to argue that the transactions dating back to the early American period um, were null and void because they were done through the authority of the state of Massachusetts, which um, claimed uh, the lands that are now the state of Maine, um, but they did not have the approval of a federal agent. And so they said, hey, that law says it's got to be approved by a Fed, a federal official. If not, um, that whole transaction, notwithstanding that it took place hundreds of years ago, was null and void. Now, if some of you lived through this period. I did. I was a student at Dartmouth uh, during the 1970s when we would hear about the main land claims uh, situation, lawsuits where the tribes were claiming up to two thirds of the state of Maine. And there was a lot of contestation, of course, what is what is going to happen? Are people going to be evicted from their homes, etc.? This all led to a settlement, an act of Congress signed into law by uh, Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, uh, the Maine Land Claims Settlement Act of 1980, uh, which uh, uh, resolved these claims, uh, allowed for uh, funds from the federal government uh, uh, to allow the tribes to purchase lands. Uh, I think each of the Penobscots and Passamaquoddies were entitled to uh, uh, something like 150,000 acres. Um, they've, they've not actually purchased that much land still to this day, as I understand it. Um, but it also accorded them recognition as tribal nations formally. But the, that act did something also very interesting that has been uh, a source of great tension even through the modern era. And, and, and it, um, again, it, it was signed in 1980, but it uh, uh, transferred or accorded immense powers to the state of Maine to regulate many of the activities happening uh, within the tribal lands. And that was quite distinctive compared to tribes further west where tribes had considerable autonomy and really were only answerable to the federal government and were essentially free of state control. So for to have an act of Congress that accorded considerable latitude and legal leverage for a state like Maine to oversee criminal jurisdiction, taxation policy, regulation of natural resources, on tribal lands was, was quite uh, an intrusion on uh, what the tribe saw as its um, uh, tr uh, traditional powers of self-determination. And those battles are still being fought today. Those of you familiar with the situation of Maine know that there has been some progress in, re in recent years. There's been some legislation, uh, some as recently as um, in May of this year, um, a law was passed and signed into law that, that begins to put the state on a pathway towards acknowledging the prerogative or in, in fact the primacy of tribal law in certain areas, environmental, uh, environmental resource management, um, economic development, uh, even in criminal uh, justice situations, particularly in the domestic violence situation. Uh, they're certainly not uh, at the level, uh, the progress is not to where the tribes would like, uh, but there is at least some progress to report um, happening there. But notice the sort of the tentacles for that contemporary situation flow all the way back to the origin story um, of our country. And so making sense out of this, uh, uh, tracing a path forward or drawing a path forward gets exceedingly complicated. Um, I'll just give a couple more examples and then uh, we'll... Uh, uh, in, in a few minutes, we'll stop for, for, for questions from, from the audience. I wanted to say a couple of things about a couple of other states, Connecticut and Massachusetts. Uh, in Connecticut, the, the two federally recognized tribes that uh, um, uh, exist in that, in that state are the Mashantucket Pequot and the Mohegan tribe, both of which were um, uh, acknowledged and recognized as tribes uh, dating back to the 1980s and early 90s. The uh, Pequots were recognized by an act of Congress in 1983, and Mohegan went through what's known as the administrative process, which is a process run through the, um, uh, the executive branch within the Department of Interior. Um, 
And uh, there's another uh, uh, important federal law that I need to uh, tell you about to tell this part of the story. Um, and that is how we get into the um, uh, discussion about casinos as a form, a, a modality of wealth creation in Indian country. Um, the story about casinos is a long and complicated one. The short version is that there were tribes in the late um, uh, 70s, early 80s, like some states that were looking to um, uh, develop or exploit other ways of generating revenue um, because of signals from the Reagan administration that the federal uh, there would be a, a retraction of, of federal funds to support the government activities of other units like states and, and tribes. So they had better um, look to uh, their own uh, resources before uh, coming to the federal government for, for financial uh, support. And so this is where we get some states like New Hampshire um, looking to start lotteries and uh, the possibility of other forms of gambling and uh, tribes began looking at this themselves. And so uh, one of the first tribes out of the box uh, was the Seminole tribe in Florida, uh, which opened a, a bingo operation that offered uh, jackpots that were substantially uh, paying jackpots substantially higher than what state law allowed. And uh, this was challenged by the state of Florida in federal court and the, and the, and the state lost uh, under the view that, uh, well, what the tribe uh, is doing is actually legal according to Florida law. That is the operation of bingo. They just do it in different ways, but it did not violate the public policy uh, of the state of Florida for a tribe to conduct uh, similar op operations, even if they did it differently, higher jackpots, et cetera. And uh, a few years later, uh, a small tribe in California did something quite similar. Uh, the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians also opened a, a bingo parlor where they were, like the Seminoles, offering jackpots, uh, drawing a lot of business away from other uh, bingo um, uh, ventures in Southern California. And California sought to shut them down and like the state of Florida lost, but their case went all the way to the US Supreme Court, uh, where the Supreme Court using the same analysis that we saw in that Florida case said that, well, look, the, the tribes are, are, are simply doing something that you allow, um, uh, a form of gambling. It doesn't violate your public policy. You regulate this, but you don't prohibit it. It's not criminal uh, for tribes to do this. Well, it took no time at all for the for the states to cross, literally cross the street from the where the U.S. Supreme Court is to the national capital. They brought their fight to Congress, and with literally within months of that California decision against the Cabazon tribe, Congress passed a law in 1988 called the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which provides the federal infrastructure, the legal framework for the operation of various forms of gambling in Indian country. And Congress, the law sets out three classes of, ga of, of gambling. Uh, class one are games that are, are, are traditional for that tribe. In other words, many tribes had ga gaming uh, activities, practices, stick games, bone games, things like the games of chance. Uh, most cultures around the world have had some forms of games of chance. And so for those, the, the, the law says that's up to the tribes to regulate. The, the feds have no interest in getting involved with, with that. The stakes are relatively low. The class two is basically bingo and all of its variants or forms. And that uh, operation is regulated by the federal government through an entity called the National Indian Gaming Commission which oversees that form of gambling. And one of the things that the commission looks for is to ensure that a tribe's operations do not violate the state's public policy, um, which in most instances it does not. And that means everything else falls into class three, which includes uh, games of chance or games against the house like casinos, slot machines and so forth. And so that's where the big money uh, is, uh, although there's big money in the bingo operations as well, but class three is the, is the main focal point for contestations between tribes and, and states. Under federal law, under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, for a tribe to operate a casino, they must engage with the state 
uh, and negotiate a what's called a compact. There needs to be a tribal state compact. And the federal law is quite specific about these are the things you're allowed to negotiate and talk about, and these are the things that are off limits. Uh, for example, uh, the states cannot use IGRA uh, or IGRA as a backdoor to impose taxes uh, on, on tribes. It's prohibited. But one of the things that's permitted is that the, the states are permitted to negotiate for a set um, fee, basically, uh, monies uh, th that uh, seek to compensate the state for what they may have to uh, lay out uh, by way of supporting the tribe's activities. And let's use the, the Connecticut example um, for a discussion point, um, for those commercial operations to be viable, the, there there was a lot of 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 work that needed to be done outside the reservation, widening of roads, the development of water and sewer systems. In, in other words, an infrastructure uh, framework that would allow for a big hotel, a big casino operation, to become viable. And the same for uh, Mohegan Sun. Um, we can attach a dollar value to the, those costs. And so, uh, but the Connecticut did something interesting. Connecticut reached out to the first of the Mashantucket Pequot and, and the same happened with Mohegan. Um, they offered um, uh, the, the monopoly on gambling. In other words, you would be the only legal game in town for which the state wants uh, a higher percentage uh, of revenue that the tribes are going to bring in. And that revenue uh, point percentage was set at 25%. At the time, the highest in the country may still be one of the highest uh, percentages uh, negotiated by any state. Uh, and so for every dollar coming into Mashantucket, Pequot, uh, Foxwoods, or Mohegan Sun, a quarter goes to the coffers um, of Connecticut. And the state, uh, the, their agreement, which was validated uh, by the federal government. These things get renewed uh, over time. They get uh, provisions, get renegotiated over time, et cetera. But they have provisions for a minimum contribution to the state's coffers. And this uh, became evident or oper operable uh, during COVID when uh, I was down at uh, Foxwoods meeting with the leadership uh, down there where I learned that uh, even while other businesses were able to negotiate some sort of uh, um, forgiveness for uh, for payments, there was some kind of latitude there. The state expected uh, uh, that Mohegan, um, Pequot would still make their minimum contributions, which I think is in the neighborhood of $80 million, if not more, despite the fact that there could, Fox was, had to close during COVID for many, many months. So there's no revenue coming in, and yet the state expected the tribe to still make its payment. Uh, and, and they did, they ultimately did make their, their payments. Last uh, uh, case study that I wanted to highlight, uh, uh, give you a sample of the contemporary issues uh, are in Massachusetts, where again, there's a contestation both over lands and, and economic development, both the um, uh, Wampanoags, the Mashpee, uh, and the uh, a gay head uh, on, a, on Martha's Vineyard are seeking, uh, have been for years, seeking to open uh, casinos uh, on their uh, respective uh, reserve lands, but there, uh, there are uh, roadblocks, legal roadblocks. And uh, in particular with the Mashpee, the roadblock um, uh, takes the form of uh, yet another story that is actually a national issue but um, has real salience in, in the uh, context in Massachusetts. Um, in 19, here's this, the backstory. In 1934, Congress uh, um, enacted a set of laws under this rubric of um, Indian reorganization. This was to serve as a, a turning away from what had been a very disastrous policy from the previous half century of taking lands from tribes, decimating the land base, uh, really a, a, a sort of the nadir of federal policies where the goal was the ultimate assimilation of Native peoples. If they weren't dying off fast enough, these policies were designed to ultimately eradicate an Indigenous presence through acculturation, through assimilation, and also the loss of land so that structures of tribal sovereignty would have been decimated. 
that ended up being a failure. And in 1934, the government shifted gears in, in some uh, respects and um, tried to work um, with tribes in terms of maybe we can work towards common goods, common aims by supporting your forms, uh, your status uh, as governments. So tribes were uh, 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 encouraged to reorganize their political structures and reorganize their uh, corporate, their economic development structures. And one provision of this law, this Indian reorganization, the IRA as it's called, one provision actually provided for the rebuilding of the tribal land base to kind of compensate for the or to, to atone for the decimation of the land base happening under the previous policy. About two thirds of the tribal land base had been lost through that previous policy. And the way basically it worked is that for tribes that were um, under federal jurisdiction, the, the language of the law, they could apply to the Secretary of the Interior for lands uh, to be taken under trust meaning that if uh, the government bought land or the tribes bought land, they could petition the government to take this land under trust. Now, think about what this means. Um, the, if a tribe had the wherewithal, the resources to buy private land on the open market, um, that land does not make it part of the reservation. In other words, it's not uh, what we the lawyers call juridical space, you know, where state law is ousted and tribal law is primary. They, the tribes cannot unilaterally grow their land base. They have to instead take the private title, their fee simple title, as the lawyers would call it, go to the Secretary of Interior and apply uh, for that lands to be taken into trust. So instead of owning the land in fee simple, outright ownership, they now have a subordinate interest. The feds own the land in trust for the tribes. But that is what makes it Indian country. In other words, that is what opens the, the gates for tribal power to flow into these spaces. Fast forward to the modern era, uh, there, 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 there was a case from Rhode Island called Karcheri um, versus Salazar from 2009, where the state of Rhode Island challenged uh, the Narragansetts when they were trying to, they had bought a, a piece of property uh, th on which they wanted to build, I think a housing complex of some kind. Um, and Rhode Island's lawyers uh, argued that um, the language of the law from 1934 said, hold on, that law says the tribe seeking to have the lands taken into trust must have been under federal jurisdiction now there was a question for the Supreme Court to answer. Does that mean federal, under federal jurisdiction as of 1934, when that law was first written, or as of the time when the tribe is seeking uh, the lands into trust transaction, which would be in the modern era? The US Supreme Court ruled that their interpretation of the language of the statute required that a tribe had to have been under federal jurisdiction as of 1934 to qualify as a tribe for whom the Secretary of Interior could accept lands into trust and thereby grow the corpus of Indian country. In Massachusetts, there, there's not, there have been lawsuits. There was one that was newly filed as of February of this year, challenging whether or not the Mashpee Wampanoags were in fact under federal jurisdiction as of 1934. Now in December of last year, 2021, the Secretary of the Interior issued a detailed memorandum of opinion that, that laid out the history of why the Mashpee were in fact under the jurisdiction of the federal government as of before even 1934, but well after. Um, that view that holding or that opinion is being challenged in this lawsuit. So, so, so that the tribes cannot move uh, on uh, establishing or building a casino until these legal uh, roadblocks are, are cleared or clarified. Where does that leave us? It leaves us with a mess <laughs> where there's some good news to report. Like I said, in Maine, there, there has been progress um, 
uh, at least from the materials I read and the people that I know in Maine say that uh, this is long delayed, but at least the state of Maine uh, seems to be in a posture of openness to respecting more and greater assumptions of political authority exercised by the tribes in Maine. So that is very much a work in progress. Um, but we see in Massachusetts that that, that that dynamic can change and play out in different ways where there is still great resistance. Uh, and, and we see kind of some of that in Connecticut uh, and Rhode Island. A few years ago in Rhode Island, um, there was a controversy where the state, the tribe, the Narragansetts were selling um, cigarettes without imposing the state taxes on their cigarettes. And the state brought out the, um, uh, the uh, folks were brought out in, in, in um, riot gear. Uh, with the German shepherds and all of that, you can go on YouTube and see some of the the uh, arrests that were made that day. The argument being that the the, the tribe was acting uh, illegally in selling cigarettes that that did not uh, pass along the state tax uh, to uh, the non-native customers uh, seeking to buy them. And that, by the way, the power of the state to impose that tax uh, was affirmed by the by the federal courts. And so so there's contestation that continues over land over power, over forms of economic development. We're certainly not um, in an era of peaceful coexistence. Um, we're still a long ways from that. Um, but I think that the, the path forward, if, if one can say it's a path forward, uh, it requires that there at least be some clarity about which of these national stories, going back to my opening, which of these stories do we latch onto? the story of the dying Indians, the ones who have ceased to exist, and why do we have to worry about this kind of stuff today? These people have uh, no claims to exercising power. They, they ceased to exist a long time ago. Or do we look at the stories that say, um, no, uh, there, there, are, um, there are, there's a moral imperative behind these laws that say, we, prom we made promises in the treaties, in the constitution, that seeks to um, engage in relations uh, that are honorable, that are legal, that are fair to both sides uh, and uh, to, to live up to our um, uh, commitment uh, to due process and, and, um, and justice. So um, uh, there are wonderful case studies that offer um, some elements of hope, you know, the sense I can find my home uh, within um, these spaces. Uh, if you're a native person and a tribal nation, but uh, as uh, the Tommy Orange novel, um, uh, the law can still operate as a kind of trap where it can locate you uh, in, a, in a position of marginalization and uh, inequity, uh, where your powers as a self-determining political body are, are not going to be fully realized because of some concerns on the other side from the states or from the federal government. Let me stop there and uh, uh, see if I can turn to um, questions. And so I'll uh, turn to Kate or Carol to uh, pose the questions uh, my way. So thank you for your attention. Okay, um, Bruce, before I uh, put the questions up, would you like me to still share the map so that people can see the differences? Yes, thank you. I completely forgot about, there was one, um, slide and I completely forgot. So yes, there's a, just to give you a sense for, um, uh, for those of you unfamiliar um, with the spaces uh, where I've been talking about, here it comes. Can you see it now? Not yet. Okay. It should be there, but evidently not. Um, so let's try this version. Can you, you see go. it now? Yep, now we can see it right. there. So okay. you can see there, this is a map borrowed from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, which works with all of these tribes. So there are 10 federally recognized tribes um, in Maine, uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. There are no federally recognized tribes in either New Hampshire or Vermont. There are native communities, uh, but they're not federally recognized. Okay, thank you very much, Kate. I appreciate your remembering that.
Okay, uh, we do have a number of questions, but um, I wanted to start with um, just a couple of local connections uh, from your talk. And one is that uh, Megan Wilden, who left as executive director of our OLLI in um, the end of March, it was her father who uh, brought the case for the Seminole Indians. Oh, down in Florida. Yes, in Florida. So um, for those of you who like uh, local connections, that's an interesting one that it was Megan's dad uh, who brought that case on behalf of the Seminole. Uh, and um, Professor Dutu did not mention the name of the law that deprived Native Americans of tribal identity and of so much land. It was the Dawes Severalty Act. For those of you who took the course that I taught in the spring, you'll recognize that. And uh, Dawes was from Pittsfield. Uh, he was a Berkshire native. Yeah. <laughs> and so that law is also very closely tied to our region. And um, much of what he did uh, was connected to um, dispossession of Native Americans, not um, in all parts of the United States, including Indian Territory with the Dawes Commission. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight those. Um, couple of uh, local connections, and we have quite a few questions here. Um, so the first question uh, is, uh, what was the reasoning? Why did this idea that Indians were vanishing, the lasting idea, um, why did that have such resonance? And what was the rationale behind it that made people believe it for such a long time? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, one one uh, uh, thing we point to was that there was a precipitous decline in the population of Native peoples, particularly in the East, but even uh, in the Plains and further to the West. Much of that was, was through pandemics, disease, um, for which tribes had little uh, to no resistance. And so um, that was coupled with a kind of fierce um, uh, embrace of an ideology known as manifest destiny, this idea that this was all part of God's plan uh, that um, created and opened these lands that uh, were for uh, uh, different societies to make better use. And so there was this uh, view um, separate and apart from the uh, demographic changes that everyone could observe, you know, by the turn of the 20th century, the uh, census uh, was reporting something like a quarter million native peoples. Uh, there's a lot of skepticism about the accuracy of that figure, but it, well, what is not doubted is that it was at its lowest point at the turn of the 20th century. But in addition to that, there's this ideological view that um, these lands were were destined for better uh, societies, for better purposes, and that the natives were simply not making good use of the land. They were wasting it. Um, and that's reflected uh, in the Johnson case that I mentioned from 1823 and mentioned uh, in, in many cases, even into the modern era um, in, two, in the 2000s, I think 2002, I don't remember the exact year, but Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the beloved- 2006. RB, yeah. Yeah, the Oneida RB, case. Yes. R, RBG, well, her, the case here is City of Cheryl versus Oneida, mm -hmm. and in which she made a reference to the Oneida wanting lands that um, uh, had now been uh, developed and so forth, but had been a wilderness, almost to kind of, uh, you know, in your face to the tribes to say, you didn't use it well, but now that it's worth a lot more money because it's been uh, civilized and developed and so forth, you're looking to make a, 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 a cash in on all of that. And even though it's it's, she's not saying that explicitly. It's it's quite clear from the tone that she's referencing what we saw John Marshall writing about in 1823. So there's a line in the 1823 case that says, to leave them in control of the land is to leave the land a wilderness. And Ginsburg echoes that by talking about your lands were a wilderness until 
Europeans arrived and Americans kind of took over and so forth. So that was another factor that that added fuel to this view it was almost like self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, because if the tribes were not dying fast enough, the Dawes Act was designed to add fire to that to say, well, then we'll make sure that it keeps running in this direction. And uh, as you said, Kate, um, this was a, um, Teddy Roosevelt called it a mighty pulverizing engine uh, to destroy the indigenous presence on these lands. And this is also the era of uh, boarding schools where native children were taken from their families and often brought, taken hundreds if not thousands of miles away so that they would lose the connection with their culture and cease to identify as Indian, the, the proverbial kill the Indian that's inside of them and save the person, save the man, was the mantra for this era. So all of these policies calculated to divest tribes of their lands, their communal uh, holdings, their view of the collective as opposed to the individual, which was the kind of root of American uh, liberal uh, theory and belief, uh, as, and, and then this idea that um, they, they were not Christians. And so there was an incompatibility with these societies trying to coexist. So I think all of that spelled doom. Uh, and so either the Indians were dying in fact because of disease or war, or they were dying rhetorically by these other moves to say, we want you out of existence and we'll write you out of existence so that the way can be cleared, you know, make way the, the path mm -hmm. and so forth. Okay, thank you. Um, there's um, another question here. So the first question there was from Ellen Quavier. Thank you, Ellen. Um, Michael Wilcox has a question. Can you expand on your comments about the problems of individuals claiming indigenous status in light of recent developments? And what are the criteria um, by which um, enrollment occurs and is there consistency from tribe to tribe? Thank you, Michael. That is a very in, uh, in, important question and many of, of my colleagues refer to it as the question or the issue of our day, uh, which is this notion of identity. Um, these policies that we're just talking about, including the Dawes Act, um, uh, are, are, are where we see the first introductions of things like measuring uh, or using a metric to assess uh, entitlement to, to lands that would be reserved to the tribes uh, and using blood quantum. Uh, you know, you must have a certain um, um, percentage of blood quantum in order to qualify. And some attribute of blood uh, was retained in federal law well into the 20th century, including the, the Indian Reorganization Act that I talked about. And so when tribes, uh, many tribes, not all tribes, but when those tribes that organized themselves under the Re Indian Reorganization Act had to also create conditions of eligibility for membership or citizenship uh, in their governments, many of them in fact, most of them incorporated um, uh, in some fashion the metrics that the federal government had imposed on tribes, which is blood quantum. And so to be a citizen of a tribe, you had to be uh, at least a half blood or quarter blood or something like that. Well, uh, you know, everyone understood that that spelled doom for many tribes because as there is out marriage, uh, exogamous marriages, uh, that will dilute that blood um, in one or two generations to the point where uh, you won't have folks qualifying. And that was exactly the point. It was to serve as a, as a cessation of federal obligations at a, at a particular point in time. But now that tribes have been in the driver's seat for decades, this is why it is uh, one of the big issues of the day. Tribes in their exercise of self-governance have choices. And so they're asking themselves, they're asking each other, why are we persisting in using uh, a metric for, uh, for citizenship that relies on a, a, a network or a system that was intended to uh, eliminate our existence? Where uh, Rob Williams, who's a law professor at Arizona, call this an example of legal autogenocide. We're killing ourselves. Uh, and that's a powerful uh, um, description of the force of what happens if you continue practices that were intended to annihilate the group. 
And so many tribes have taken a hard look at their citizenship requirements. Many still have a minimum blood quantum, but a number, significant number, um, are using, they're still requiring some sort of a biological connection to the group, the ancestral uh, group, uh, but they're measuring it by way of lineage. So if you can show um, lineal descent from an unquestioned uh, ancestor, so for many tribes, the, those roles that were created to uh, administer the Dawes Act, you know, to dispense, uh, distribute lands, um, if you can cite an ancestor whose name appeared on that role uh, and you show through the generations that you are a lineal descent, your blood quantum doesn't matter. You can be eligible for that tribe. Uh, that is a minority of tribes that have gone that direction. Other tribes are experimenting with things like, well, why don't we write our citizenship rules in terms of what we want to see changing in our community? So for example, um, if we want to uh, halt the, um, the diminishment or the decline of native languages and traditional cultural knowledge, why don't we make that a part of one citizenship? You know, when uh, folks immigrate to the U.S., they have to know something about the history and the political system of the U.S., and tribes are, are thinking about including some of those. So, for example, some are, are, are including a language re proficiency requirement which if you don't have the language, you're not penalized. Um, there are gradations, you know, there's kind of a pathway to citizenship so that you're given a number of years to become proficient in the language. Other tribes use a residency requirement to say, you can only be a citizen if you live here. We want you to stay here. And that is to counter another federal policy from the 1950s and early 60s, the urban relocation programs where the government was paying uh, tribe uh, individuals to leave their tribal nations to make their way to an urban center and basically use the urban landscape as a tool for assimilation, that the uh, once being in the big cosmopolitan network of the ur urban center, they would lose their affinity, their connection, their love of their homelands, and uh, the Indian in them would be destroyed. And that's why we have major concentrations of Native peoples in cities like LA, Minneapolis, Seattle, Denver, and so forth. It's not like it was ac an accident that Natives said, let's all go to LA. <laughs> So it's a, it's a, Michael, it's a great question. It's one that's intensely controversial. There are a lot of writers, native and non-native uh, writing about this. And there are artists writing about this. Tracy Deer, who's a Dartmouth alum and is a Mohawk woman did a film years ago where she uh, 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 turns the lens literally on the, the practices of you know, who is in and who is out and saying, what, what are we doing? We need to really take a serious look at what these practices uh, um, portend for our own future. Yeah, thank you so much for such a, um, a wonderful answer. And I can't resist adding, uh, I used to tell my students that the most interesting places to look for research papers were where there seemed to be contradictions. And so for those of you listening, uh, who know something about the internment camps that were created for Japanese Americans. <clears throat> the same guy who created the internment camps, whose name I'm blocking at the moment, uh, was Dylan. the person who created the urban Indian program of the 1950s. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, one person who had a very important role in uh, trying to wipe out the um, identity, the cultural identity of two groups in the United States. Uh, so I'm going to go to Will Singleton's question. Uh, what kind of public works have been created by the indigenous groups that have casinos to help improve the lives of members of their tribes, as well as work with other tribal casino owners to improve living conditions for, uh, for indigenous peoples without casino licenses. Yeah. 
Um, a, a terrific question. Um, it varies, the experience varies across the country. Um, in the East, I know that um, the tribes in Connecticut um, have been quite generous in um, creating essentially uh, no interest loans for certain tribes to help them with um, building uh, housing or government buildings to headquarter their government operations, uh, partnerships, uh, startup capital, things like that. Uh, internally, many tribes have um, created various mechanisms. Some have created a network of nonprofit corporations that can funnel, of, to which they can funnel um, the proceeds from um, either gambling or um, uh, wherever the other sources of money, some of them are making money on uh, leasing their lands for agriculture, for ranching, for extractive industry, uh, gas, uh, coal, um, uh, oil, et cetera. And then and the networks of nonprofit uh, organizations um, can uh, administer uh, services like language revitalization, cultural revitalization practices, housing for uh, people, particularly elderly, uh, housing. Um, the Seminole tribe down in Florida uh, has been uh, using their, um, there's an entire book, by the way, that one can, uh, that has been done. It's, a, it's one of the earliest and best ethnographic studies of a tribe that has um, uh, acted to pull, put its uh, financial resources um, to rebuild um, not just the the commercial and economic infrastructure of the community, but the cultural aspects as well. So Seminole, as some of you may know, uh, became the, they, they bought out the, um, uh, um, oh my gosh, what's the big, it's a, it's a multinational, multinational, um, I'm completely drawing a blank. Someone hopefully can rescue me here. I mean, it's like, it's a well-known, and I'm, I'm thinking Starbucks. It's not, I know it's not Starbucks. Uh, it's, it's a restaurant chain and so forth. But in any event, um, it, it, it is one, uh, extraordinary to see where they have put, plowed their resources into housing, into cultural practices. Hard Rock Cafe. Thank you, uh, uh, Carolyn. Yes. Hard Rock Cafe uh, Network. The book that I mentioned is by uh, Jessica Catalino called High Stakes. She's an anthropologist from UCLA and wrote this book um, on the Seminoles and looking at the kinds of things that they've done. Um, uh, one of the things that's interesting is, um, you know, there are a number of Seminoles who historically have been ranchers. So you have native cowboys, um, but many of them don't make money because of the price of beef uh, varying so much and, and so forth, including imports from uh, Argentina and other parts uh, south. And so, but what they do is they've subsidized um, the cost for feed and other things to keep these folks in business so that just like we do with dairy farmers in New England and, uh, and the Great Lakes area, they're doing to uh, subsidize those businesses that have a strong cultural meaning uh, to members of the community. Um, so, so there are examples all over the place. We could devote a whole other uh, lecture to Alaska, which has uh, its own unique history in terms of how the government relates to the Alaska Native peoples, where they imposed not the reservation system, but a corporation system. They have, were forced to organize under for-profit corporations, but they also have spun out nonprofit entities to do this kind of uh, nurturing of the cultural fabric of the community and to the, a certain extent share some of those resources um, with, with less fortunate tribes or tribes that don't have the opportunity for um, uh, that kind of economic uh, development. Okay, thank you. Um... We're going to take a little shift. We have uh, two questions uh, with regard to the uh, recent Supreme Court case uh, written by Justice Kavanaugh um, regarding uh, the boundaries between uh, tribal um, criminal cases and, um, and state uh, yeah. power. So um, would you be able to comment on that case? Yep. So last term, this past term that just ended um, in June of this year, uh, Justice Kavanaugh 
wrote the majority opinion for a 5-4 decision in a case called Oklahoma versus Castro Huerta. Castro Huerta was a non-native man who had allegedly committed a crime, um, criminal neglect of a minor uh, who was native. And the question was whether or not the state of Oklahoma uh, retained jurisdiction over uh, such a person who was non-native, but had committed the crime in Indian country. Now, that question became a question because of a case two years ago called Oklahoma versus McGirt, uh, which was written by uh, Neil Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch who has been a surprising vote and voice uh, in favor of tribal interests, at least so long as treaties are involved. And so let me tell the McGirt story and then I'll come back to Castro Huerta. Um, McGirt involved, Jimmy McGirt was a, a, a native man, Muscogee Creek, who had uh, allegedly committed a, I say allegedly, but he was convicted. So he committed uh, a, a, a really awful crime. Uh, and um, was prosecuted uh, and sentenced to life um, or, or maybe even to death <laughs> um, by the state of Oklahoma. His lawyers later brought an appeal that went to the U.S. Supreme Court challenging the power of Oklahoma to exercise criminal jurisdiction on the grounds that uh, the alleged crime took place within lands that were still part of an extant reservation. And so the whole question turned on whether or not the Muscogee Creek Reservation was still in existence or whether it had been disestablished, you know, eliminated through multiple acts of Congress, et cetera. The court was again severely split in a 5-4 decision, but this time in favor of the tribe. And the author was uh, Neil Gorsuch. He opened uh, this opinion, which actually is a an incredible opinion to read. It has some of the most incredible positive language. It's almost like a literary treatise. It's the opening line, for example, says, at the end of the trail of tears was a promise. Who writes like that? <laughs> uh, we don't have many justices who can craft a beautiful sentence like that. At the end of the trail of tears was a promise. And that promise simply was, you, know, you will have these lands, you know, we, 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 the, we the US government, we're forcing you off your lands in the east southeast because we can't tolerate natives as neighbors. So we're gonna use geography and move you thousands of miles away, but we promise to leave you alone forever. That was the central promise. And no state or territory will intervene in your affairs, et cetera. Well, history didn't play out that way. And uh, so what the court had to do is to look at all of the intervening acts of Congress from the 19th century into the modern era to see is there evidence where Congress ever acted to, to, to break that promise. There is the power to break the promise. Uh, that wasn't questioned. What was, did Congress exercise that power to break the promise? And the majority found that, nope, they came close. They, <laughs> tribal, you know, the reservation got nibbled here and there, but it by and large, stayed intact. Therefore, Jimmy Smith, Jimmy uh, McGirt's crime was in fact committed within the Indian country, which means state criminal power stopped at the reservation border and only the federal government could prosecute such a major crime. Even the tribes couldn't prosecute what he had done because it was at the level of a felony. Now we come to Castro Huerta, uh, who is a non-native person who commits a crime against a native person. And there had been some precedent that led to the argument that as long as Indians are involved, either as perpetrators or as victims, and the crime took place in the Indian country, state law cannot apply. The only time state law can apply is if only non-Indians are involved. That's it. So this was a bit of a fuzzy area. And the Supreme Court was split 5-4. And this time said, well, um, this is different because this guy is a non-native and our cases have not been so um, explicit as to oust the state all the time. 
And in fact, there are good reasons for why the state's law should be present uh, to fill the void, to fill, you know, to make sure that there is accountability. Otherwise, uh, reservations would be, um, you know, there would be lawlessness within the reservations because the tribes cannot prosecute non-natives, thanks to a Supreme Court opinion from 1978. So. Kavanaugh's opinion is dressed up as if it's we're doing you a favor because we're providing you with law and order uh, and security and so forth, and sort of ignoring that there was this entire apparatus of federal tribal partnership to make sure that if the tribes can't prosecute, the feds were there as the backup. And so it has completely, you know, when you look at the language of the opinion, it announces a new starting point, a new uh, assumption. The historic assumption was that state law does not apply in Indian country unless Congress explicitly allows for it. Under the Kavanaugh analysis, the starting point is state law applies in Indian country because they actually said reservations are essentially a part of the states of which they are a part. No court had ever written anything like that. So there's a totally new starting point. State law does apply unless you can find a federal law that explicitly takes it out of play. And that's going to be hard uh, because Congress didn't need to act all the time because there was this longstanding assumption that state law did not apply. So why would you write a law that states the obvious? OK, thank you. Um, one more question here. We're almost out of time. Um, you mentioned that you are uh, part of the Homa tribe, which is recognized by the state of Louisiana, but doesn't have federal recognition. Could you comment on the differences between um, what happens in Vermont with the Abenaki, what happens in Massachusetts with the Nipmucks, and what happens in Louisiana with the Homa? Yeah, um, so our, our situations, are, you know, there's some similarities, but there are also lots of differences. Um, Louisiana has been surprisingly supportive um, early on uh, from the 70s to uh, work with the tribes. Uh, that has not always been the case in Vermont with regard to, to the Abenaki or the Abenaki people where there's concerns that, you know, is this, a, is this a way towards landing a casino in Vermont or something like that? And, you know, Democratic and Republican governors have expressed that concern as, a, as an excuse for not supporting the Abenaki in their quest. There are two pathways. Uh, two major pathways towards achieving federal recognition. I tell my students it's, it's two doors that lead into the same parlor, the federal recognition parlor. One door has on the top of it act of Congress. So Congress can always pass a law that recognizes a tribe. And they did that with the Mashantucket Pequot. And they're all sorts of political reasons why Congress might, might want to do that. Um, the, the alternative is labeled the administrative process is where tribes go through this uh, very laborious and very expensive and time consuming process operated under or through the Department of Interior, where there's a seven part test that the tribes have to meet. Um, Congress does something comparable in enacting an, an act of Congress. So there are some indicia of you know, credibility, authenticity. The, are you a legitimate group? Or are you a group of folks banded together in the modern era um, seeking uh, the benefits of, of, a, of a finding that you are a native tribe? And so you essentially have to come up with evidence that um, whether you do the administrative route or the political route, that your group has been around uh, for a long time. The time period has uh, uh, been shortened a little bit. Uh, it used to be from time immemorial. <laughs> which was defined in the regulations as the time of sustained contact with Europeans, um, which again, for the Eastern Seaboard tribes, that means that you have, you have to go back three, maybe 400 years uh, uh, going through the courts of the, you know, the library of the conqueror, as uh, people would say to, say, to find the evidence to say we were recognized, we have been around, these have been our lands and have been acknowledged as our lands. We have retained a sense of autonomy and community and political authority amongst our, our peoples. In my community, we feel that we've made that record 
um, but the, the, the federal um, government in 1994 issued a preliminary finding saying that we had dropped the ball, we had not passed muster in showing that the clear line of descent from a historic tribe. So there's this 50 year or so historical gap in the evidence. And this really boils down to uh, what is the evidence required to tell one story? Do you put stock in the oral tradition where a lot of my elders, for example, helped um, you know, relay that story um, over time? So we have documentation of that, but they're not PhDs in history or anthropology and so forth. <clears throat> or do you just go by the paper trail only? And I think that's where we have this profound disconnect is in terms of what constitutes viable and credible evidence of the legitimacy and the authenticity of this group calling itself a tribal nation. Because now that there's value in that, it wasn't always positive to say, you know, put your hand up and, and declare yourself to be an Indian nation. Uh, that signs you up for a, a lifetime maybe of misery you know, relocation and having your children taken from you and your language stripped from you and uh, criminalize you for practicing your religion. These are all the things that being native could mean depending on, depending on which historical period you were born in. Well, now that people can say, we can start a casino, we can pass uh, tax laws, we can do this, we can do that. There is value added. And so the stakes are higher. And that means the criticism uh, and the skepticism is higher uh, where people are saying uh, you have to really prove that you're not a sort of fly by night group. And the, that's unfortunate for the groups that have been at this for such a long time when there wasn't really much at stake except for the, the honor and the sort of uh, the ability to say we're still here. You haven't succeeded in annihilating us. We're still here and you haven't done the job, and you need to acknowledge that. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, there are many more questions, <laughs> and many thank yous to you, uh, Professor Dutu, for uh, uh, sharing um, so much of your knowledge this evening. Well, can and I just say, I'm happy to answer questions for those of you who did not get a chance. I'm easy to find on the Dartmouth website uh, in period Bruce period due to at dartmouth.edu. So please feel free to send me an email with your questions. I'd be very happy um, to respond that way. Yes, and I can affirm that uh, Professor Dutu responds very quickly <laughs> to emails. Um, I do want to uh, close with just a comment um, for those of you who might be interested in the future lectures. Um, so um, our final lecture is going to be with uh, Drew Lopenzina, who is a Pittsfield native, a graduate of Berkshire Community College, and now a professor of Native American literature at Old Dominion University. And uh, he is going to be speaking about William Apes. Uh, and Apes was uh, a civil rights leader on behalf of the Mashpee uh, Wampanoags, uh, who uh, Professor Dutu has talked about tonight. And that is one of the federally recognized tribes in Massachusetts. So if you want to learn more about that story, uh, please. Um, sign on for the lecture uh, with Professor Lopenzina. Uh, so I want to thank you uh, for all of your questions, uh, for your excellent attention. And um, thank you so much um, to Professor Dutu for uh, a fascinating uh, conversation this evening. Thank you all.